Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Mark de Jong. I, uh, I'm a platform architect at ING. Um, been working there for about 14 years um, um, in all kinds of infrastructure positions. And I'm, Rob, with me. I'm Rob de Boer. I'm a, I'm a lead engineer for the support team. Uh, I joined INC, ING about five years ago, so that's quite recently compared to Mark. And uh, we're here to tell you a bit about uh, the quality. Quality of our deployments within ING. Um, but first, a short introduction here. Um, uh, at ING, we have our own private cloud. Um, and to enable cloud-native workloads in our environment, um, we actually run our own host, uh, uh, container hosting environment, um, which is called the ING Container Hosting Platform. In short, so it's ICHP. Um, ICHP is a managed Kubernetes platform uh, based on OpenShift, and we provide namespace as a service. Um, uh, this way, uh, the, our developers don't need to worry about underlying infrastructure, and they don't need any Kubernetes knowledge. Um, by providing namespace as a service, we heavily rely on the multi-tenancy capabilities of OpenShift in this case, um, and we went a bit to the extremes. Um, we force quotas, for example, um, to make sure there's no noisy neighbor effects on everybody. Um, and we also set a lot of network policies by default to disable the connectivity between different namespaces. Uh, so each namespace is its own security boundary in this, in this model. Um, for all of this, to implement it, we build our own controllers and our own autoscalers as well for the uh, quota environment. Um, and they will actually be partially open sourced next Thursday, live at KubeCon. Um, so everybody should be able to make use of that uh, uh, in the near future. Um, as ING is a failing on me here. Um, ING is uh, uh, in a regulated industry, as we're a bank. Um, we have a large and strict risk and compliance framework. Um, to take away the burden of all these controls and everything else, um, we, we made available this platform for everybody to use. Um, so we reduced the cognitive load of our developers so they don't need to worry about running their own Kubernetes cluster. Um, and to say we have a quite a bit of success in the area. Uh, we actually started this uh, um, platform in 2018. Um, we went live in 2019 after a bit. Um, and we actually shared our story uh, uh, a while back already at OpenSense Commons a few years ago. Uh, and we actually did an update uh, last year at uh, uh, OpenShift Commons in Detroit. Um, currently, uh, to say something about the size, we're uh, running over 2,500 namespaces um, with way, way more than 25,000 uh, deployments and over 45,000 pods. Um, they're all spread about, uh, across about four clusters, I think. Um, and the cluster sizes vary between 28 to 200 nodes. Uh, and all of it is running on bare metal. Um, and a really important requirement to be able to run on ICHP is that you need to be immutable and stateless. So we don't support any state in our clusters. Uh, this is really important to keep in mind, uh, especially when the next slides come up, uh, and Rob's going to explain a bit more on that. Um, but as ING is a bank, we're a large financial institute uh, with uh, locations all over the world. Um, and we have a lot of developers and many, many, many business domains. Um, we need to be able to make sure that our environment is av uh, available. Um, and as we're a regulated in, uh, industry, uh, there's a lot of compliance and risk that we need to take care of. Um, and, and for our consumers, uh, like I previously said already, um, we need to make sure that we're available. So everybody needs to be able to use his mobile app or uh, the website to uh, transfer money or pay something. Um, last year, however, for example, um, during a normal workday, uh, at least many of the Dutch guys here will probably know, um, ING always pops up in the news. Um, um, <laughs> in this case, uh, the mobile app was down. Um, and the ICHP team uh, immediately dove into the clusters to check, hey, is it, is it our cluster? Is, it, uh, uh, is the cluster failing or whatever? Um, but the weird thing was that the cluster was fine. Everything was working. And actually, the, the uptime was like 100% for the entire year already. Um, so we, there was no failures in the cluster. Um, so we had to dive into what was the actual cause. Um, and I can't tell you the actual cause. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, during our investigation, we came across a lot of interesting findings in all the deployments that we're, we're running um, and how people were actually using our platform. Um, and those findings and what we did with them, uh, Rob is going to elaborate on a bit. 
Yeah. So when ING is down, well, for whatever reason, we can't tell you. <laughs> it will be in the news. People will be talking about it. And uh, we had some incidents last year. And uh, the question was raised from upper management, like, can we improve this quality? Because it seemed to be the quality of our consumers running it, because we were basically not down. It was just working. So uh, could these incidents be prevented in the future? That was the big question. Are all, are all our users, all the teams within ING, using uh, all the possibilities of uh, Kubernetes to the maximum and build resilient containers? Are we doing the right thing? We had no idea as a team. So um, keep in mind, it's a big blind spot for us. It's uh, not only for us, but also for all the technical teams and the managers within ING. So uh, we decided to set a baseline on what all deployments should look like. And that's a bit of difficult, because um, how about exceptions? Not every deployment is the same thing. So we needed to have some basic checks. But keep in mind, we're talking about 25,000 deployments. So we started on, the, on, on yeah, basically, how do you scan that? And uh, what we found out is uh, bad practices on non-production were just copied to production, because it was already there, and it's easy. You build something in development, and you just copy it. <laughs> I see you laughing. <laughs> that, that's basic practice for the most of us. And so we decided to scan everything from, from development all the way up to production. So if development is good, your production will also be, well, at least better. <laughs> so, so to get good insights on the whole topic, we decided to scan everything. So that's 2,500 namespaces, 25,000 deployments, and over 45,000 45, pods and images. That's a lot of information. And we gathered all the information, we processed it, and we made it available in a, well, a bit more readable format, because the, the total output was like a couple of gigabytes. Uh, what we found was a bit of a surprise. Uh, we know that the, the developers at ING are quite capable. So it's not an issue. But there were a lot of gaps towards a containerized platform. They were not using all the options available within Kubernetes. And they were not even building resilient containers. They just forgot stuff. They were used to the old-fashioned virtual machines, and they just copied their code. But copying your code and deploying it on a virtual machine differs from something on a containerized platform. So some teams didn't even think about it, and they, they tried to solve issues themselves, which is wrong, because all the options are there. So, so somehow we need to make everybody aware of it. So we created a dashboard. And uh, in this dashboard, it's, yeah, it's, like I said, it's still 2,500 namespaces and 25,000 deployments. And give or take 600, 700 teams. So ish, yeah. Yeah, so there are 700 development teams in there. So to create a simple dashboard with only the information required which we used in the baseline. So we put simple stuff on it. Uh, for example, um, in, within ING, you should never, ever touch your namespace. If you access it uh, without a pipeline, you will get a bad score. That's a bad thing. So we call it tainted. So as soon as you access your namespace, we call it tainted. We put a lot of points on that. So we started a scoring system. The higher the score, the worse, you the worse quality you provide. So we put a really high score on that. That should shake people up, not to access their containers and use proper, proper pipelines. But we also looked at simple things like host and zone affin uh, affinity. That's an easy fix. It's just three, four lines in your deployment. That's easy. They're not, they're not using it. We don't know why, but how can you make them aware? So again, put a score in it. A bit less than the tainted stuff, because uh, we don't want uh, the scores to be too high. And other simple things, like health and readiness probes. And you need to think about them. And they started thinking about them, which basically solved a lot of issues. If you have a good readiness probe, your application, if it fails, well, you run replicas. So we put scores if you're not running replicas. 
So it's, it's quite simple. But we just added more scores and more scores. And you can see it's, it's, it's really simple, the output. And um, yeah, that's it for now. So Mark. Yeah, so the, 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 as Roach mentioned before, uh, we did the investigation. Um, we started to give insights uh, based on the dashboard you see here. Uh, in a previous format, it was just HTML table. Um, so it wasn't nice. Um, we did the investigation. We started the insights to your consumers. Um, and uh, we had started to explain to the, our developers what they would need to fix. Like indeed, uh, Rob said, uh, uh, some easy fixes for anti-affinity, replica states, uh, liveness, register slopes. Um, and, and all of these were scored. And for each of these parameters, we actually wrote down the effect of setting that parameter, what it would mean to your deployment. Um, and next to that, we gave uh, example code on how it should look like in your deployment, so they could just copy-paste uh, more of the generic uh, settings, for example. Um, and specifically, uh, earlier, we had a panel here, discussion on, on platforms. And within ING, we use a lot of platforms. We build a lot of platform teams. Um, uh, and we ourselves, as a platform, uh, uh, provide capabilities there as well. Um, one of the bigger ones we have, we have a generic CI/CD capability, which is called One Pipeline. Um, and this team provides Git, pipeline, artifact repositories, and all kinds of other stuff, um, including automated compliance for your uh, deployments. Um, so this is also the only way into our platform. Um, but then again, One Pipeline is also a platform, so other teams can build on top of that. Um, and one large team uh, within ING actually builds a generic uh, built and deployed pipeline, uh, which includes everything for your risk control of an ING specific implementation of a service mesh. Um, and we work together with that team to actually implement and put in the code that we put in the best practices. So everybody that did their next deploy automatically had all kinds of fixes in, in implemented. Um, so when that was implemented, I think about 60, 70 percent of all workloads were automatically fixed on a lot of the settings uh, because everybody just uses that template for their deployments, which is a really, really easy win for us. So that really helps to have all kinds of platform teams uh, in, in that context. Well, making things better is always uh, a fun thing, but also a challenge. It's, uh, the previous thing was a wake-up call for most of the teams. They, they had high, low scores and Nobody wants to have low scores. So the, the team started even competing each other not to have the highest scores within the departments. So it was fun for us to see oh, some teams struggling, but also the questions raised towards us were like sometimes crazy. Um, so the users were informed of all the, the features being present now within Kubernetes. And only the easy ones to fix. So it, there were still some challenges to it. So the first goal was accomplished. We created awareness within the teams within ING. But we also got a lot of questions from, from teams like, uh, um, some of your, uh, your rules or your scoring system does not apply to us. It's not applicable to us. So uh, we had to look at those. And sometimes we had to create uh, uh, exceptions for those, for example, a monitoring tool or whatever. Uh, but those are all generic, again, like you, you provide to a service within ING. So some team was providing that, and we could easily rule them out. And uh, we had less false positives in, in, uh, in the report. In the next version of the, uh, of the dashboard, we also put in a scoring system. So we now can easily add uh, a scoring system in the database, and it will automatically be added. So it will be real time. So the, the, the new dashboard will be using uh, uh, a database at the back end, and all the information is stored in the back end. And just by pressing one button on, on the system, we can add a new score to it. And the scores will be automatically updated, real time. So that's uh, the most important thing to us is the quality is really improving. We made people aware of it. And I guess that was our main goal. Yeah, goal for us, uh, indeed. That was our goal. And I think we managed it quite well within just a couple of months. Yep. And then an important thing I forgot to mention, actually, uh, uh, because it's best practices and, and most of them are generics, we actually enforce them in policy as code as well. So if you deploy into the platform and you don't have it anymore, um, you get audited at first, and then at the end you also get blocked because you just can't deploy anymore. Um, so that's always a fun thing to do as well, to make sure that you're securing your own platform. Yes, yeah, simple things like uh, an image. Yep. Uh, it should not be too old. It should be uh, quite recently. So image is older than 120 days. Opa, we put a score to it. Uh, failing pods, they were just forgotten by teams. They, they had pods that were failing, and 
never no. looked at again. Yeah. They need to look at them again because they got a score on it and you want to have as least score as possible. So that's a, a bit of the background w which, which we did. We did a lot of insights into, uh, into our environment and to see uh, the maturity of our, uh, our developing teams. And uh, we were happy to help out there to uh, bring everybody to a higher level. Uh, with that, we end up with questions about this one. Over there. Uh, we don't provide any storage. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, in our uh, design, we have two distinct uh, 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 use cases. Um, the use case we're talking about here is completely immutable and stateless. So we don't provide any persistency in any workloads. Um, so you can only run. <laughs> it's not, uh, okay, it's working. So if the application was simply lifted to the container, and they uh, usually like to write a lot of logs, detailed and so on. Yeah. So yep. <laughs> yep. That's, that's definitely another one. Um, I, I we started out uh, uh, pr sending all our logs out to the generic environment, uh, which we stopped um, because of reasons. Uh, we, uh, we filled up the entire log environment uh, after three days already. Um, uh, so we stopped forcing everybody uh, to push logs towards standard out. Um, uh, so everybody uh, logs towards their own environment. But specifically for the ephemeral or the empty deer or uh, 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 other types of uh, ephemeral storage, um, we limit it to uh, like a gig. Um, so five. Oh, five gigs, actually. Five gigs. Uh, so nobody can use more than five gigs to do anything locally uh, and then it being gone. So Even five gigs is a lot for a typical application. Correct. But uh, as I said, we run fully on bare metal and we have about, well, 16 terabytes of storage for each node. So limited thing to five gigs per pod uh, and then going up to... 160 pods on a node, you fit into the amount of storage we have locally. So we saved at least our platform from that side. Um, but indeed, it's not a, a good use case to uh, log locally in a pod, of course. Because why I'm asking this is that a lot of my customers like to run with the minimum uh, disk size for the node because they think nothing is there at all. So why even bother to put something bigger there? So we, we, we catered for that in the design to uh, count the amount of pots we want on a node, <laughs> limit it to a specific amount of pot, and then we make sure that doesn't break th the node at least. So is this published somewhere? Uh, no, I don't it's think so. I, I think it's just, uh, in my head, it's at least just a, bad, uh, a good practice to have in mind when designing a cluster. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Any more, Whoa, more questions? Last question. Last question? There's two hands over there, so you, you can decide between the two of you. Uh, no, we are, we are, we're actually thinking about uh, the, the publishing some of the parts that we did. Uh, um, uh, we are publishing some other stuff on Thursday, but th th this might be an extension to that code being extended there, so it might be in the future. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I was stating that the platform didn't send any logs. Um, we enforce our consumers to log directly towards like a Kafka bus or something else. So the, 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 the consumer itself needs to directly publish their logs to something else, not the, via the platform. That was it. Thank you very much. <laughs>